Welcome to Manstream Media, a place where you'll hear the news and the issues from a male-friendly perspective. We have with us tonight Paul Elam, the founder of A Voice for Men, live from Houston. Paul, how you doing? I'm doing great. Hello, everybody. Hello to Paul. And, and we have Warren Farrell, author of The Myth of Male Power and so many other outstanding books on men, with us from San Francisco, from Mill Valley. Welcome, Warren. Thank you. It's really nice to be here. It's always a pleasure to be with you, Tom. It's good to have you both here, and I'm Tom Golden, coming from you from outside of Washington, D.C., and tonight we're going to be talking about men's studies, and who can kick us off? Who's going to start? Warren, you want to start it? Sure. Uh, let's see. I think the thing that I hear most frequently when I hear people talk about men's studies, or when I talk to a feminist about men's studies, I still do talk to feminists, um, is the is, wait a minute, Warren, history is men's studies. You don't need men's studies. Every, every history book is filled with, with stories about men. And my response to that is history is the opposite of men's studies, that you're really degrading women's studies when you say that because women's studies is questioning the traditional female role. Um, the, a history book is reinforcing the traditional male role. And your job as a feminist is to get people to question their roles, not to reinforce their roles. So you, so history is the opposite of women's studies. It is not a questioner. It, by, by celebrating and admiring the men who are performers, it reinforces and bribes boys and men to feel that they're only visible if they perform. They're only useful if they perform. They're only um, and and so to risk their lives in war, so they'll be a war hero. They'll have a statue uh, made after them. That reinforces the traditional male role. So history books are the opposite of women's studies, and so it's really important, I think, for for um, the fem because in, until the feminist hears and understands that, she can't even get off of first base on that issue. Um, the second thing that I think that's really important about women's studies is that. That it, that it has covered, it, it, is a, it is an examination of the female experience of powerlessness and the male experience of power. It is not an examination of the male experience of powerlessness and the male experience of female power. And so, uh, and, and in fact, all gender studies issues really should come from a minimum of four places. It should be the female experience of powerlessness and the female experience of power, the and the male experience of powerlessness, and the male experience of power, and should be both the conservative and the liberal male should be incorporated in in um, in all of that discussion, as it should be transgender males and and gay males and gay females, and so women's studies has done a good job of taking the female view of the world, and what it's done is it's reinforced men's tendency to not speak up, so men have put their heads in the sand and hope the bullets of female analysis about men being the patriarch and, um, and having made rules to benefit men at the expense of women, uh, those questions, those um, analyses of, the, of the, the way the world is, has as a result of there not being men's studies, they have reinforced men's tendency to be fearful of speaking up about these issues. And, so, and the problem with that is many of these men and women and, and our students they look at their mother and father and, and, and the relationship that a girl or a boy feels about his, uh, her or his dad is very powerful. And if you go to school and you, uh, to a university and you start learning that men are bad and that men, you know, the, your father earned more money or your father is more likely to beat your wife or dominate your, dominate your wife and the fact that he earned more money to send you to college is a, is a result of is an example of him being a, a patriarch and him being a dominant force and um, but and there's no discussion of the fact that maybe what did your dad want to do what was the glint in his eye that made him that that he would have loved to have done would he have loved to stay home and take care of the children full time as 49 percent of men do when the Pew Research Center asks men that question this is full-time working men being asked the question what would you prefer to do if you could do anything you want, work full-time or be home full-time with your children? 49% of men say, I prefer to be home full-time with my children, hmm. but I feel I need to be the person, who, um, according to roles, that um, is, is, is doing the work. And so, yes, men earn more money when the children come along, 
um, but they earn more money because they feel they have to. The woman expects that that's what they'll do. And those are, those are roles that need to be questioned um, as opposed to uh, just glide it over. That's the function of men's studies. If a girl is a student in her class and she thinks that you know, her father just dominated her mother and went off to work and earned more money and that was about privilege and power, she never sees how maybe the things that her dad wanted to really do, maybe work as an artist that would have created less money, work part-time, be full-time as a dad, those, his, his desires are never seen by the girl in feminist studies and therefore her attitude toward her father becomes more negative and therefore her feeling about how loved she was by her father giving up what his the glint in his eye was to do the things that he knew would give her a bit more options than he had those things are never understood by her so that so the existence of women's studies is really discrimination against women it is damaging to women in their relationships to their fathers and their fathers are half of themselves. So the genes of a, of a girl or a woman in school is half the dad's genes and half the mom's genes. And if, if she is believing that half of her is sort of about privilege and power and that type of thing, and the man she might marry is about privilege and power, and the boy she might bring up is, a, is, you know, is part of the dominant sex, those are really destructive introductions to the life experience for a, a woman who is old enough to understand things but young enough to be impressionable at college age uh, would have. And this is to say nothing of what, what happens with the boy, the son, who, um, who perceives himself as potentially being not only like his father but also um, having the, being, being a negative force in the world and a destructive uh, force. So those are just a few opening thoughts about uh, yeah. why there's a need for men's studies. Warren, that is fascinating. You know, the whole idea that history itself is pushing men into their sex role and holding them there. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, that's, that's a really important point. I hadn't thought about that before today. You know, that's fascinating because, uh, you know, you see the typical thing with the uh, feminist justification for women's studies. They say, oh, it's all about white middle class males. You know, which is what I've heard over and over again. And it's like, wait a minute, I went to college when I was, you know, in the 1970s, before women's studies ever came about. I never saw one course that had to do with white middle class males. Not one. It was all about people who were extraordinary, people with power, people who were, you know, famous, people who were, you know, the, the geniuses, not your average people. Yes. And so they completely left out. I mean, it's just the justification for women's studies is, is is silly in my mind. Now, I think it's a good idea to study both men and women. Mm -hmm. I think it's wonderful to study women and to look at, you know, how do they how are they different? What makes them tick? What can help them? But the same thing needs to happen for men, and that's what we're missing in my my yeah, opinion anyway. Absolutely. And Paul, what are your thoughts? I think there's a, a whole lot to this. One, I, the first thing I want to point out is that right now on the front page of AVoiceForMen.com, you will find a, an article by Warren. Uh, much of it has been taken from uh, the original text of Myth of Male Power, but it has to do with women's and men's studies, and it's a great expansion on the points that he's already, the very good points that he's already made here. Um, one of the things that I think does deserve to be mentioned is that I one of the positive benefits that I saw to women's studies uh, and actually to uh, I guess certain aspects of feminism itself is that we did reach a time in society where it was important to allow women to imagine themselves to be something other than their gender role that this and it was overdue coming. I don't buy the, the big, bad, evil patriarchy routine or the, you know, 5,000 years of oppression argument, but I do remember being, I think about 13 years old, about the time we landed on the moon, I remember looking through a help wanted section of a newspaper and I remember seeing jobs for men and jobs for women. And all the jobs for women were like Gal Friday, uh, secretary, stuff like that and all the jobs for men, and I even knew at 13 years old that there was something wrong with that picture, that the, that in the idea of self-actualizing, of, of moving on into what we wanted to be in life, that there probably needed to be a change, and I think that change was a very, very healthy one for our society. Uh, however, it becomes unhealthy when that 
freedom of choice is not extended to both sexes. And that's where we run into a, a really big problem because what women's studies purports to be on the surface is often not what it actually is. One, the idea that you know all other studies or men's studies has already been quickly debunked here. It's a silly notion uh, to think that, that the a world history or as we study the world is a reflection of the average experience of men in any culture. It's, it's certainly not. It's about the most remarkable people. Uh, but the other thing is is that um, we have uh, women's studies changed their name for a reason because I don't think that they, they were able to overcome that argument that and, and to really successfully assert that all studies were, were men's studies. So they changed to gender studies. And, and now all these women's studies programs are called gender studies, and the line from that is that, well, we cover everything. And no, they certainly do not. Um, I have never seen an examination of male suicide rates come out of a women's studies researcher. It is totally and completely ignored. I've never seen research um, out of a women's study uh, person with a women's studies background about the experiences of men who seek help when they're victims of domestic violence. We have to go to people like Denise Hines for that, who documents this stuff and who has researched it thoroughly and then is lambasted by the feminist community for putting out that information. Uh, what we see is a, a, we've got a women's studies environment that is, is oppressive. It is a, a, a dogma and a ruling force that pushes very hard for there not to be the honest scholarly pursuit of information about men. And I don't know, I mean, I think what Warren said was great, that we look at how men are disadvantaged, how they're advantaged, how women are disadvantaged, and how, and how they're advantaged. But what I would like to see most of all is just honest scholarly pursuit of the state of being of both sexes, that we look at actual data and research, non-ideological stuff, uh, because, you know, when you try to force everything into a particular paradigm or worldview, then the idea of, of actual research gets corrupted. And we've seen a huge amount of that in these studies we've seen from the AAUW uh, and, and many other organizations that simply manufacture uh, stuff that supports the feminist narrative and seeks uh, to prevent the actual study of men. Uh, we've got uh, organizations like the American Men's Studies Association, uh, OMSA, which purports to be what we're talking about here, the, about the study of men. But if you look at what they do, they're very beholden to, to feminist ideology. Uh, they are basically, uh, I would call it men's studies with a fig leaf on, uh, because they don't actually study men. What they do is they help manufacture a narrative that paints men in the, in the idea of patriarchy and of power and women in the role of oppressed um, and leave us with this oppressor, o o oppressed dichotomy that supposedly defines the world. We're so far away from honest scholarly pursuit of the sexes that I, I think the idea of an actual men's studies or male studies that's committed not to ideology uh, but to honest scholarly research is something that can help balance both sides of this uh, because it will be debunking a lot of the information that are, is produced by feminist ideologues and if it becomes a source uh, of information about the sexes that is culturally accepted, I believe it will force a sense of balance between the two areas of study that's badly needed. I absolutely agree. I think a lot of people don't realize the degree to which um, there have evolved things like speech codes. There are now more than 200 universities that as a result of having women's studies without men's studies have um, have deemed it to be sexist if a man, if, if comments are made such as, I'll, I'll read you one from the University of Michigan. Um, at the University of Michigan, the phrase, women just aren't as good as men in this field, is specifically included in their speech code as an example of an offense. 
but it is not it's perfectly fine to say men just aren't as good as women in this field. There is nothing that is negative about men that is in any speech code that I'm aware of uh, that is prohibited. But it's the type of thing that I just said that is in the speech codes that is prohibited if it is said against women. Then this is considered uh, something that, now what is the result of violating a speech code? The result of violating a speech code is that you can be expelled from the university. You're up for disciplinary action. And so, and when you're expelled from a university, this can be on your record for life. Um, and so, and have an impact on you both um, in terms legally, but also in terms of the psychology of being um, dropped out, being seen as sexist, being seen as something wrong with you. Um, when I was talking about this with with somebody uh, recently uh, at, a, at a presentation, a woman came up to me from the University of Illinois and she said, "I am a student in, at the University of Illinois in women's studies, and I tried to write something that was uh, they, they had said that no father was a good father, but my father." Um, is my primary parent, and he's a wonderful father. He's my primary parent. This is a much better father than my mom as a mother. And so I wrote about the value and the contribution that my dad had made to my life and to my, my two um, brothers' lives with my dad. And she said I was torn apart. And um, and it was brought, it was brought up not just by the teacher that I got my I had gotten straight A's in the class. This is the first non A I got. I got a C on this. Um, this paper um, and the teacher sort of brought it up as an example of what was uh, and what was the problem with it. Asked the children, the, the students in the class, to sort of analyze what the problem was. I was so embarrassed, and you know, I just shrank. Um, and she, this woman, not a shrinking woman, <laughs> she's a very um, assertive woman. Is, uh, but it was that type of um, that type of response to any person in a men's study, in a women's studies class that says, wait a minute, it's not true that men are, in, are inherently rapists. It's not true that domestic violence is predominantly an act of power. It may be if, if, if you say in, in a women's studies class something to the effect that male and female, men and women, are victims of domestic violence about equally, and here's more than 100 studies showing that, and most of these studies are done by women, and many of them are by feminists. And there's no real significant contradiction to to this among domestic violence studies. Um, there, then, and, and you you will not have a chance to complete as much as I said. Um, from what I have heard from people taking women's study classes, that would not even be allowed to be to have gotten that far. And you know, I'm a person who's taught women's studies. I taught at San Diego State in the Department of Women's Studies. Um, and the you know, at the beginning of the uh, of the um, women's movement, and I'm very and I'm very happy to have um, made visible many women in history who made contributions that were invisible. Uh, the sadness of people having to change women having to change their name. Um, in order to be uh, like Marian Evans, having to change her name to a male name, in order to to be um, to be uh, able to publish, those are things that I'm so glad that we're that we have, have significantly confronted, and it's important for women to know that they have plenty of um, potential for power and brilliance and math and science and every other area, and so STEM and um, the the science, technology, uh, engineering, and math that have uh, have grown up as a result of uh, women's programs and the women's movement, these are all blessings and no one wants to take away from these. But we all want to add the things that are happening to boys and men. I was thinking as you were talking, um, Paul, that I'd like us maybe just to spend a few minutes just imagining together, the three of us, what a men's studies curriculum would look like. What are some of the things we would deal with? And uh, maybe just go back and forth among us. I would start with paternity fraud as one example of what uh, would be dealt with. Maybe Tom or Paul, maybe you can elaborate on paternity fraud for a minute, and then we'll maybe do some other examples of that so people can get an idea of you know, what specifically would men's studies deal with. Well, you know, the first thing that comes to my mind about what men's studies should deal with is that we need to teach our boys and our young men and our older men now how we are unique, how men are different from women. And there's so much that's gone on research-wise 
you know, with the whole uh, testosterone flood that happens in utero that changes the brain into what we're calling the male brain, it changes men into being more competitive, to, to be more dominant, assertive, uh, and to, it changes women into being more nurturing. We need to know this. Our young boys need to know this. That I've seen so many parents who want to take their sons and teach him how to sit still and talk about his feelings. Well, you know, that's okay if you want to teach him that, but you've got to come from a point of understanding that this boy is not biologically geared to do that. He's not at a point where it's going to be easy to move in that direction. He's, it's going to be harder because he's got a biology that sets him up to do things differently. So, you know, the one of the things I'd love to see is just some teaching, some very good, clear teaching about our biological differences. What makes us different? Why? How is it that men are more competitive? And they are. In fact, we know now that competition-wise, that men thrive on it. When men are faced with competition, it motivates them. It moves them into a place where they want to try harder. When women are confronted with competition, guess what it does? It makes them more anxious. It does not have the same impact that it has on men. So things like that I think are just so important for everyone to know that you know women are good, but men are also good. That'd be my theme, Warren. How about you, Paul? Well, first I want to caution everybody that's going to send me hate mail that, that is saying that, that Tom is putting all men and all women in a particular uh, uh, bottle or category. He's not <laughs> doing that. He's talking about the preponderance of men and women, and he's absolutely correct uh, in terms of our natures. And this <laughs> is a matter of scientific research. It's not yes. some speculation. Paul, thank, you. thank you for that. that uh, in, it's very important to know that. And in fact, we know now that about 80% of the boys get this testosterone flood in utero, but about 20% of the girls get it too. So this is a very complicated mess. This is not something where it's all men on one side and all women are on the other side. This is a blend. But we can talk about most men having this testosterone difference. And the, and the importance of what you're talking about, Tom, um, is that when a teacher is teaching in the school system, and the school system is cutting back on recess, or in many schools, actually eliminating recess, or when the kids are running around the playground and, and playing tag, and, um, and, and, um, and the teacher says, wait a minute, don't run so much, don't run so fast, don't, don't be careful about other people. Um, this is all, uh, this, this is not what energizes boys. When, uh, when I, I tend to teach, as you know, I, when I do my workshops and things like that, I tend to get everybody involved, and I didn't realize when I was student teaching um, earlier in my career that um, one of the, the the teacher who was the supervisor came up to me and said, "I have an interesting thing that's been happening, Warren. You've been uh, a lot of the boys in the class have been have been much more interested than they were previously, and uh, and we didn't know that the reason for their greater interest was that." Everything I did was about role playing, and I would, you know, I would, I taught political science, and so I'd have um, men play the Democrats and women play the Republicans, or vice, and then vice versa. I'd have, so I'd have people play the Democrats and Republicans. They would, they would be, they would, they were allowed to be Democrats if their parents were Republicans, allowed to be Republicans if their parents were Democrats. So they had to force themselves into different ways of thinking. We'd have a, a political political um, convention and people were up on their feet and making signs and making posters and things like that and I didn't I didn't know that that was appealing to boys because I didn't know at that point in my life that boys were project oriented they were they were they wanted to be physical they wanted to get together and, and make things and do things it just happened to be my style of teaching um, and now as I look back on it I see why the boys were much more um, involved girls were also but they but I didn't know that you know lecturing when I if I had been prone to lecturing that hearing words and taking them down on paper and regurgitating them back to me uh, was not the male way of learning. Mm. You know, uh, I, I guess what it, along those lines, I, I'm going to finish addressing what uh, I started to there about, you know, when Warren asked, what do we need to look at? I mean, he brought up paternity fraud. Uh, and we know, for instance, that 30% of the men who become suspicious about paternity and seek having it tested find out that they are indeed not the father 
of the child. That is an awful lot of men, a lot of duped dads out there. That is a, a big issue. Um, I'm interested mostly in what helps perpetuate that because we can sit here and, and point out that 30% of men who, who try to find out about paternity find they're not the father. And then the discussion ends and we go on about our business and nothing happens about this. And this is an incredible thought when you think about it, the, the level of betrayal in uh, having a, a child by another man and then taking the resources from a man who's not responsible and lying to him and having him emotionally invest in that child and everything else that goes on. It is a huge betrayal and a huge fraud on horrible levels that were happening to women in this culture. We would be having, you know, uh, take back maternity rallies. It, we would freak out culturally if this were happening to that many women. Um, what I would like to, to see men's studies do, and actually what I would like to see women's studies do, I'm, by the way, I'm not going to call it gender studies. I'm just not. It's not. It's women's studies. And um, what I would like to see happen is some honest, non-ideological research on the socialization of men and women. How do we raise them in this culture? What sort of expectations do we place on them? I think that uh, most feminists would tell you that uh, uh, it certainly would be archaic and antiquated to raise a young girl to expect that she could never do anything except look for a rich husband and, uh, and be a housewife and a mother. Um, I wouldn't raise uh, uh, any child with those sort of uh, expectations, although I think they should be allowed if that's what they want. Um, but th on the other hand, we need to start looking at how we raise boys to be disposable. And I mean a very, very serious look at the messages that we send them. And it's not just about their feelings. I don't think you can train <laughs> boys to express their feelings. I do think you can allow them to. And you can refrain from messages like big boys don't cry or don't be a whiner or a loser. You can certainly change the language around that. But what it comes down to is a very, very tough proposition. Uh, and I mean one of the toughest ever in human history because I really believe if we're ever going to find a sense of balance between men and women again, what we have to do is look at how we socialize men to be on white horses and how we socialize women to be on pedestals and then start looking at strategies to have both of them get off and stand on the ground facing each other. Yes. That is not a message that a lot of women want to hear. With all the, the banter and the, 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 the carrying of banners about how we need to end gender roles, when you yeah. really start talking about what it takes to end gender roles and to have people acting with autonomy and freedom and agency, then one of the things that has to go out the window first is chivalry uh, in, in the sexual sense. It has to be dispensed with. It means that if you've got a flat, get out the jack <laughs> and start jacking the car up and figure out how to change the tire. That's what we're really talking about here. But when, as a culture, when we start getting close to that kind of dialogue, we see men and women both repel from it. Yes. Uh, but then they'll go back and say, we need equality. Um, and so there's something going on there that keeps that conversation from happening. Yes. And I really think that something has to do with gynocentrism. Yes. You know, the, our does. culture is built on gynocentrism. It's built on men taking care of women. And our survival has has been a product of that. And it's been a good thing in some ways, but now it's tearing us up. Yep. You know? And you, you see this in the, the colleges and universities in, in a very crucial area. We, I live in California, as you know, and... Um, in California, we have the affirmative consent legislation, which means it used to be that um, you know, that women would say, you know, what is there about no that you don't understand? And if a woman said no and a man pursued, um, then he would be considered possibly a sexual harasser or a date rapist. But now California has passed a law which says that there's a, a you have to have affirmative consent. That is, you have to have the woman actually say yes affirmatively, and it has to precede your kissing her. It has to precede 
um, your movement at each stage of the uh, development sexuality. But no one is saying that women and men need, women need to share the responsibility for the risks of rejection with men. That we're, we're talking about what men need to overcome uh, the barriers, we're talking about increasing the barriers that men and the, the hoops through which men need to jump in order to be able to not be fearful of being kicked out of school if they, if they do it improperly. But no one is saying our childhood education needs to be from seventh or eighth grade on. Um, teach, as soon as girls and boys learn about sexuality, is making sure that girls know that, that equality includes they're risking sexual rejection as often as men do. And if they're not looking inside themselves and saying, why are they uh, colluding in an atmosphere in which, we, uh, in which the, the guys are expected to risk the, the rejection, or which, more precisely, we say, sex is dirty. Boys, you risk, um, you, you risk taking the um, risks of rejection with the dirt. So we have the sex that is less mature, boys, um, and um, taking risks of rejection with the sex that is more mature, uh, the sex that knows very little about girls and very little bit about sex, uh, taking the risks of rejection with the sex that knows more about sex and more about relationships, it has more verbal skills in the age of 7th, 8th, ninth grade. Um, we have it all backwards. Um, and this may be biologically natural, but if we're going to be talking about equality, there, we have to say to girls, you know, that part of equality is not just saying what's wrong when men do it wrong. It's sharing the risks of doing it right, sharing the risks of doing it wrong uh, as well, and right. And, and that is what is included in equality. So let's not just increase the blame on men and the areas in which men can be blamed. Let's increase both sexes' responsibility for uh, moving the sexuality of both sexes forward. Um, rather than just uh, blaming men. And so this is the type of thing that would be discussed in a women's studies class. And in order for it to be discussed without the women and men tearing each other apart, one of the crucial aspects of any women's studies class would be men and women learning how to listen to each other, how to Im immerse themselves in the other sex's experience without contradicting, without just, just hearing their stories um, and their hurt and their pain. And, then, and if you know, we're talking about boys expressing their feelings, we can train them to do that. We may not be able to train them to do that, but we can at least uh, take away the barriers that make, it, that make it clear to boys that the moment they speak up and express their feelings, they will be shut up and repressed. Now, that is not an encouragement for any, any feeling that's inside of a boy uh, to be uh, articulated. Hmm. Warren, can you give an example of how a woman could share the risk? Yeah, so for example, a really good question. So um, first of all, when she, uh, let's say, she, she, she walks into a party and somebody says, oh, there's, you know, Tom over there. He's, um, you know, he's a really, um, you know, well-known psychologist. He's really brilliant. Um, you know, you should probably meet him. Um, and so she then um, makes herself uh, physically uh, within, within a, um, a visual um, distance of you so that maybe you'll notice her. Well, instead of making herself visually available to your uh, observation, um, that she, that the school system talk and parents talk about the fact that she might consider actually going directly up to you and saying, um, you know, and striking up a conversation. If you don't, um, if you don't pick up, if you don't say, "Gee, I'd like to call you later. Can I have your phone number?" She says, "I'd like to call you later. Can I have your phone number?" If you don't call, she calls. Uh, or even <laughs> whether or not she thinks you'll call, she calls, or she's uh -huh. going out. If she's if she's if she's saying to you, um, you know, I, uh, as she picks up information about you, she realizes that you love to go to, a, let's say, a museum, or you love to go to a a, um, a Redskins game. So you know, go out and get tickets to a Redskins game, and say, can I take you to a Redskins game? Um, after the Redskins game, um, maybe reaching out and taking your hand um, and, uh, and not having a contract necessarily need to be signed because of affirmative consent because we know that it's highly unlikely that you're going to sue her for taking that risk. <laughs> and uh, and, and then, should she get permission first, Warren? 
Yeah, you well, according to California law, she she should. But practically speaking, one of the great things about women taking sexual initiatives is that there aren't very many. I've never heard of a man suing a woman for reaching out. <laughs> <laughs> it, it may happen before it's yeah, over. It may happen I, I have, one of these days. Yeah. Though, that uh, I mean, and this is important to say that if if you do want a decent woman. You're not going to find her at a Redskins game. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Listen to this guy. <laughs> Warren, thank Fuck you very much for that response. You <laughs> <laughs> cleared it up for me. You know, I, should, uh, I, should, I should have said a Houston game. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I'm a Dallas fan. Uh, I'm a traitor in my own city. Um, oh. But uh, <laughs> we won't talk about that. <laughs> That's okay. Of course, uh, the Redskins did playoffs. beat Dallas this year, so yeah, that was when, that was back when you were in, uh, almost able to go to the playoffs. But uh, this season, <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> we'll see the Super Bowl. At least, at least Dallas beat Detroit. I, I think there is uh, uh, another side to this too, and again, it goes back to what we're we're dealing with in boys. Um, it is, what Warren's talking about, I think is real important, and we do need to have a, a different contract between men and women than we've ever had before. That's more current with the times, that is, uh, it reflects an understanding of current political realities between the sexes, and that is more healthy and likely to be less risky. I was um, going to say, safer for boys. Yes. Right now, it is not safe. But here's the deal about that that I think is, is, is really, really important is that there are, I think we have to admit that the idea of women find their sense of femininity in being pursued, that that is a reality that is extremely difficult to overcome when you have women getting the message bombarded throughout their whole lives that they're, if they're worth anything, men will come to them. They will, men will offer, let me pay, let me do this. And the more that happens, the more feminine they feel. Um, I think a way to, one way to approach looking at, at, at trying to change that is in how we train boys. And um, I don't think there's anything wrong with sitting down with boys in groups everywhere and explaining to them the history of mankind, how their biology is, and, and what they're programming, and their, their sexual feelings and urges, and talk to them about what, one, what a glorious thing that is, and two, the, the ways that it can make them think that are dangerous to them. And to start talking to them about their own worth outside the approval of a woman. Yes. That they need to understand, and of course, we have to have grown men valuing those boys in order to get that message across. We can't just throw a note at them in a, or, or turn it over to a school teacher. Uh, we need to have mentors and fathers involved teaching young men that their own biology will trick them and make them make bad decisions and that uh, it is a very natural human thing to do but that, and teach them that, you know, you've one of the ways that you can live a healthy life is to look at, at yourself first. What are your needs? What are your standards? How do you want to be treated? And so while you find yourself being attracted to a girl, don't lose sight of the fact that there are these other very important things that will last a lot longer than your attraction to a woman initially. And that if you don't keep them in mind when you start, uh, again, I don't think there's... Um, uh, a magic way to overcome, I mean, adolescent sexual biology in boys oh. is like uh, uh, absolutely no. rampant and I out of control. What you're but saying is that we need to let boys know that they have value just being who they are. I think you can plant the and seeds. We've spent at some 50 point, years telling them they don't have value. Yes. And that's and, one of the things that pisses me off the most. How yep. can we do that? It's so, it's just remarkable. Dinocentrism. Exactly. This is why we On steroids. all this stuff to begin with is that we have been so reticent to <sighs> appear as critical of women or critical of of, of feminism or and it is, and let's face it, it's not just feminism. Uh, I had a father that would have knocked me across the room if I disrespected my mother. He wouldn't care 
if if I maybe had a reason to not feel as respectful, it would, the logic of the situation would not matter. This is old school chivalry, old school warrior type mentality, and that is just as much a destructive force in the life of boys, I think, as anything that they've gotten from feminist ideologues in the last 50 years. Yeah. But I think we really can plant seeds in young men for the idea that, uh, because a lot of times, you know, lessons in life, you know, what you're raised to be comes back to you later than the point that you get the lesson. You may not hear it at first, but if you hear it enough and then your life circumstances match up to that lesson me making sense later on, then you can start snapping into gear and saying, okay, wait a minute, maybe, I, okay, I met this girl, she's got a hot body, she's really pretty, um, and what else do I know about her? Absolutely nothing. Uh, and then say, wait a minute, let's start finding out who she is. And once you get a guy doing that, then you've changed his life. And you've changed the life of women around him. I, I really agree. I think there's a... And if you can do that, Paul, I'll give you a medal. Well, I, I think it actually is reasonably doable. I mean, nothing is... You, you don't change biology completely, but you do... Um, I think let's start with what Paul was saying at the beginning about talking about, well, first of all, that last thing you said, Paul, about that planting seeds. That That is a male-female differentiation in parenting, by the way. Uh, a father is far more likely to say something to a child that will not completely register for the child at that point in time, um, but and the mother will be critical of, of the father doing that because the child, the mother says, doesn't completely understand what the father is saying, but the father is planting the seed of, that will that as life begins to piece itself together, uh, the child will will use that seed to sort of say, oh, that's what was meant by that. And one of those seeds is you you started out speaking about the you know talking about the history of humankind and and what that and that includes the history of men being programmed with this enormous testosterone and that the purpose of the purpose to, of that testosterone biologically throughout history has been that when a man saw a woman, the faster he could have sex with her, the more he would reproduce, and then he'd go on and, and, do, and do that with somebody else. But today, when you have sex with a woman and you reproduce, you're responsible for that child for the rest of your life. And so um, before, so that, the, that, that what, your, what our testosterone drove us to do uh, was functional in the past for reproducing more children, but it's not functional for you, my son, to have a better life because you'll be responsible for that child. She can abort or she can sue you for support. You have to, if she, whether if she aborts, you don't have a, a, a sense of it, but if she try, tries to sue you for support, you're responsible for that support for the rest of your life. She has the choices, you don't. So when you act on your biologically natural sexuality of desiring to have sex with her, sex with her, which only happens with you know, which you desire for about half of the girls in your class that you're attracted to, um, if you were to operate by having sex with half of those girls in the class that you're attracted to, you'd have a number of lawsuits on your hand. It's not functional behavior to do that. And so um, th those are so and so I think that's level two. You know, one was the history, and the other one is the the seed, planting of seed, and the third is how do we learn these things? And I got frustrated in my first six or seven years of speaking on male-female issues. I'd go back four or five years later to a place where I had spoken before, and people's lives really hadn't changed that significantly. And I was pissed at myself for wondered why. And so that's when I started doing the role reversal dates in the men's beauty contest. And I sort of said that you know what what really needs to happen here is not just talking about the we if you want to have a man understand what it's like to be looked at as a sex object um, have him be in the beauty contest of everyday life that women go through and so I'd invite 400 500 women men up to the stage and down the, the aisles and have them go through um, uh, uh, gauntlets of women lined up who would be um, yelling at them and and making comments about their bodies but that also left a lot of men having seeing that the people who were the winners of the beauty contest were not them and they felt like the losers left behind and left out. And it began to give them some sense of what it felt like to be a girl or woman whose, whose main focus of the other sex was her body. And then I, then I would ask the, the women to 
uh, sit according to how much money they expected to make in their life, and the ones that expected to make more money would sit in the first rows, and then they'd sit back further and further, um, um, d depending on how much, uh, how little money they were making. And then I'd ask the women to take a risk of asking out the guys to whom they were most attracted. Well, some of the girls who were assertive got guys that never would have asked them out. Some of the uh, some of the other girls couldn't even begin to get up the nerve to ask guys. These were girls who were very bright sometimes in school, who otherwise were uh, you know maybe very effective on campus. But when it came to social relations of asking out a boy uh, that they were really attracted to, they started getting nervous and sweating and acting like jerks. And so their empathy for men um, increased enormously when they saw themselves exaggerating things or acting like jerks or suggesting that, guy, that they'll pay for dinner and lots of other things at a, at a restaurant that they couldn't afford. And so it's, I think, when you emotionally immerse the other sex in what the other sex goes through, and then you have the, the feelings come out of that, and you talk about what you just experienced, uh, uh, that begins to increase. At least I found that was the best way I could do to increase uh, men's empathy for women and women's empathy for men. Hmm. Interesting. And, you know, when we're talking about the whole idea of uh, teaching our young people, I think one of the things that bothers me, too, is we've taught girls that if they've been oppressed for so many years, that they're owed a certain amount. Mm -hmm. And I think this whole idea in girls' minds leaves them with a sense of being owed in relationships. And, boy, relationships are such a sensitive balance that if you've got one side that thinks they're owed and the other side doesn't think they're owed anything for that, you're going to have trouble automatically, just automatically. And I, I think that that's one of the things we've done that's completely screwed up our relationships is we've got women now thinking they're owed, that men had it all. I mean, somehow they've gotten this idea across that men had it all. Men had it all, and now it's our turn. What are you talking about? It's zany. And then they get in relationships, and the women expect a certain things from the men, and the men are thinking, wait a minute, this isn't fair. So A year or so ago, Tom, I was... Um, doing expert witness work for a father who had a daughter. And um, the father was really upset that the mother had kidnapped the children, taken them to the parents' house, uh, thought that the children were all hers, and wanted, you know, he was a doctor and he, she, he earned significant money. She really wanted the, you know, a significant amount of money from him so she wouldn't have to <laughs> have to work. And he understood that. And, um, and he was, you know, but his heart was torn out by the loss of his children and uh, having to fight for them, and you know the scenario. But he had so when I when I went to do the observation that I do pre before doing the expert witness work, um, there was his daughter's room um, filled with princess toys, uh, painted in pink, uh, with all sorts of fairy images you know, all over all all over it, and it was like I said, you know, um, I'm not going to give his real name, so let's say Jim. Um, yeah, Jim, do you realize you, everything you're complaining about, about your, your um, future ex-wife, uh, everything you're complaining about, about her, you're helping your daughter to be. Huh. You know, like, you know because, he, because we as guys, we hold women precious. We, the, the, the theme of the men's movement is that we have power and we want to oppress women. Nothing could express a, a, a greater amount of misunderstanding about men. Yes. Uh, we hold women precious. Yes. And this father, despite being taken to court and, uh, and being soaked for everything he had and having his children taken away from him, was held his daughter so precious that he wanted to make her into a princess. He wanted to make her into the woman he had married uh, that had turned against him. And um, and so uh, and so this is the these are the caveats of of our love transforming into things like making our daughter think that she's entitled to a uh, a man on a white horse to save her. That creation of entitlement is one of the worst things that we can do with our with our daughters, and that comes from the what you're saying, Tom. I believe that you know a gynocentrism that has been part of our culture for the last thirty years. Yes. I wonder, Warren, I've got a question for Warren on this. Um, 
I, I wonder as you look back in, in folklore, fairy tales, and these fantasies that we raise young girls with, uh, I mean, you can get princess gear from uh, little infant outfits all the way up into, I guess, your 80s if you want to. Um, why the princess and not the queen? Um, uh, one of the things that I came up with was, and, and this is purely conjecture on my part, is that the queen of, is a role of responsibility. Uh, princess is really the role of entitlement. Uh, and uh, it, it may be oh. nothing to do with that, but I found it curious that as long as you're going to fantasize and, and wax royal uh, mm -hmm. about what your life ought to be, why would you choose princess over queen? Because queen, princess also implies more innocence, and so and and you and we we love people who are innocent. We love people who are young. Um, and princess is youth, and it's innocence, and it's all the life in front. And, and with queen implies a few wrinkles, a little bit of extra. Yes, and Paul, <laughs> if you I pulled into as much. Right? If you treat your daughter like the princess, you don't piss off your wife, who is the queen. <laughs> ah, there we go. I think that makes a lot of sense, too. At any rate, I do want to say, if you're a guy that's really sick of the princess, think about killing the prince. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. It's all, it's all a tango, and we have to, and, you know, what part, of what the, part of what women's studies without men's studies misses completely is that it is a tango. And if you want to, you know, in the moment you change any part of a dance, you change the entire dynamic. Having women's studies without men's studies is like having, and calling it gender studies, is like having Republicans teach party politics and calling the course party politics, and or only Democrats teach party politics and calling it political science. Um, it, we, we would never consider doing that from only a Democratic or Republican perspective if we understood that. Although most universities do teach things more from a liberal perspective in the social sciences, but um, if if we had as a rule the democratic studies, and then we took it over and said party studies, and we still had only Democrats teaching the courses, most of us would recognize that that isn't a party studies course; it is a partisan course. Yes, you know I've seen over and over again that with women's studies, it seems like it's the same sin that's being committed, and that is the sin of only seeing this much of something. Mm -hmm. Yes. Really. They only see the woman's powerlessness in women's studies and the man's power. It's like only seeing the female victims in domestic violence. Yeah. It's just all of these issues over and over again. The feminists will tend to see one small slice, but the rest is completely ignored. You know, I've and always we, phrased that, Tom, as, as seeing the extreme ends of the bell curve, that uh, women's studies proponents characterize men when they're talking about advances for women, then they see all men as the upper 0.5 percentile of captains of industry, <laughs> congressmen, men of power. And if they're talking about the, the things that they don't like about men, then all of a sudden they go to the other end <laughs> and they pick out the, the bottom 1% of men that are in prison for uh, doing various crimes and who are horrible human beings. Yeah. But still, neither one of those groups represent 98% of men. Exactly. But it seems like that they're, depending on what they need to push or what their agenda is at the moment, then the men are, uh, is filled in by whichever <laughs> end of that spectrum is necessary for them to further their ideas. You couldn't agree more. You turn up the heat. Yeah, we got a lot, a long way to go to change that in education. I don't think it's going to be anytime soon, but uh, hopefully we're developing a little bit more cultural impetus these days for people to say, wait a minute. Yeah. And, and that is happening, and that's always uh, good and refreshing to see. Slowly but slowly. I think <laughs> we have there. Slowly, it's happening slowly but painfully. Yes. <laughs> I think one of the if you're uh, uh, if you're listening to this and you're you have a feminist friend and you're sort of saying how can I even introduce these issues to uh, one of my feminist friends or maybe my mother who's who still thinks the world is you know uh, made by men for men uh, one of the things I think that's very helpful to ask a woman to do is to ask uh, ask her to find the glint see if she can find the glint in her dad's eye imagine when her dad 
um, lived at a point in time. Imagine what, what, what her dad wanted to do when he was very young. Um, ask her to sort of think about, you know, what makes your dad really happy that just he seems to be at, a, at his peak in terms of happiness and, and, and give a few examples like you know, maybe he's at his peak when he's playing with your children, the grandchildren. Maybe he's at his peak when he is uh, just totally happy when he's fishing or golfing or um, maybe when he's singing in a choir, maybe when he's uh, writing poetry, maybe when he's doing art, maybe when he's um, out hunting, maybe when he's playing sports. Um, maybe when he's watching sports, um, and so and and then ask the second question when she's identified the glint in her, in, in her dad's eye, and then say, you know, imagine when you were born, your mom and dad sitting down and saying, which would um, which would make more money to support um, you, you and your brothers and sisters effectively, doing more of playing with children or more uh, fishing or more um, making things in the garage, um, or more, um, uh, uh, more sports, or more um, uh, golf, etc., uh, or doing what he did, being an accountant, or being an engineer, or you know, working as a garbage collector. And almost always, the, she'll be able to come to the fact that, well, actually, you know, following the glint in his eye would not be what would make him um, would have made the most money. Doing what he did would make the most money. And that begins to get a woman to personalize the fact that her own dad gave up the glint in his eye to earn money and that therefore earning money is not about privilege and power. Men earn more money when there's children as a way of giving up the glint in their eye to, to make your life better than his life was. And I find that that often starts the beginning of realizing that there is a type of studies besides just women's studies and women as the oppressed. There is a way of, um, there is something that they haven't thought about, about the man, his aspirations and his desires that opens up the door to um, um, men and women's studies being taught together. Yeah, well said Warren. Gentlemen, are we about there? Are we finished for the night, you think? I think we're finished. Uh, we're, we're pressing the edge of people's patience. Maybe maybe that's a good way to stop, Warren, is right there. Paul, you got anything else to say? Uh, no, I uh, just uh, enjoyed this discussion. I want to wish everybody out there a very happy new year. Uh, we uh, let you know that uh, I have taken time off during the holidays from a couple of things. Uh, one of them is the the food column that I've started. I am coming back to it uh, this week now that the holidays are over. Uh, we have uh, we put a, an end to the hangouts and all other really extracurricular activities at AVFM for the holidays to give everybody a bit of a break. Uh, but I'm glad to be back in full swing here and looking forward to a very, very, uh, I think, is going to be a monumental year in the men's movement. Uh, it, it, 14 was fantastic. I think this next one is going to be really, really great. I agree. I well, agree. Press one sentence on uh, of what's the highlight you're most looking forward to in 2015 for the men's movement. Well, I have to do it in two sentences, Warren. Uh, right. Maybe it's because you asked for one and I'm rebellious. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I am looking forward, and I can't reveal the location yet, but uh, we have secured our venue uh, for uh, ICMI 15, and looking forward to making that announcement, uh, the first one, uh, even with all the difficulties we had getting it off, was absolutely phenomenal in terms of the esprit de corps we saw developed there and the uh, connections made between the attendees and, and with the speakers as well. Uh, the other thing is that AVFM is uh, quickly narrowing in and, and getting uh, our grips on doing this the right, it, the right way. It's, it's why it's taken so long is that we are opening a publishing house um, and it is going to really focus on a lot of material that more mainstream publishers have decided to shy away from. Uh, and uh, we are getting all of our ducks in a row about that, and I think that that's going to be a very important development for us because we're going to be able uh, to offer people a substantial platform uh, to have books published uh, online and hard print books uh, that will 
help get this message out there to a lot more people. So I'm real excited about that. So the mainstream media becomes mainstream publishing. That's right. It sure does. And uh, we are going great guns on it right now. Uh, it's taken a while to get the LLCs and everything else worked out for this and, and uh, having contracts developed and, and all this other work. But uh, we're doing it right the first time. And uh, so can't wait to, to, uh, to unleash that on the world. And it's such a needed thing to have, you know, to have a publishing company that's going to push men's issues because we've almost got nothing out there now. I, I, really, on that note, I, I just want to really acknowledge you, Paul, for all the effort that you do to put these so many pieces together that aren't just pieces of rhetoric, but they're pieces of you know, dealing with lawyers and dealing with venues and dealing with thousands of, of um, legal, political issues and, and really making this happen in a big way. And Tom, the extraordinary work you do contributing to this as well. I just really feel very honored to be doing this with you guys. And back to you, Warren. I, back at and you I respect sure. deeply as both of you guys. So thank you yeah. very much. And, and I'm looking forward to this year being together and doing this on Thursdays. And on that note, remember, there is no I in Manstream, and men are good. Good night, folks. <laughs>